uh, Mark chapter number 15. We'll continue our series on Sunday mornings through the gospel according to Mark. And uh, this morning we'll look at the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And next week being Easter, we'll continue and look at the resurrection of Christ. And uh, in the next few weeks we'll finish this book and move on to another series I believe the Lord would have for us. But Mark chapter number 15 and verse number 1. If you're there, would you say amen? Most of you... <laughs> Some of you are about two seconds behind everybody else. That's good, though. Uh, Mark chapter number 15, and let's, uh, we'll begin reading, I said verse number one. Let's, we're not going to read the entire chapter, but let's begin at verse 12 and read through verse 15, all right? Mark 15, verse 12. The Bible says, And Pilate answered and said again unto them, What will ye then that I shall do unto him? whom ye call the king of the Jews. And they cried out again, Crucify him. Then Pilate said unto them, Why, what evil hath he done? And they cried out the more exceedingly, Crucify him. And so Pilate, willing to content the people, released Barabbas unto them, and delivered Jesus when he had scourged him to be crucified. Father, I pray for your help again as I preach your word. And God, I pray that we would not only learn information about the crucifixion, but would you make personal application to everyone's heart. And Lord, my main desire this morning is for those that do not know you as Savior, would turn to you in faith, to trust you and you alone to be their Savior and forgiver of their sins so they can go to heaven and have a relationship with you forever. But God, I pray for Christians as well that you'd stir our hearts about what you've done for us, your love for us, and how we ought to be surrendered and devoted to you. Help me, fill me, empower me, I pray. I don't want to do anything without you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I think it's more understandable now, more common to hear the talk of this, but people are increasingly frustrated um, when there's an obvious injustice. There's a lot of talk about different kinds of justice. Um, maybe one day soon we'll talk about something like that again. Um, but in 1984, years ago, James Ely, he was convicted in the 1982 brutal murder of 33-year-old Christine Parker her two children, and one grandchild. Two years later, uh, the Illinois Appellate Court overturned the conviction, even as justices uh, acknowledged that Ely most certainly was guilty. They said that police had arrested him without probable cause and conducted an illegal search, and they threw out virtually all the evidence against him. Ely was eventually released from prison after his parole from another offense in 1999. Uh, what made it worse is two decades after his first murder conviction was overturned, he was released. Ely was arrested in December of 2006 for the murder of Mary Hutchinson, the manager of a Burger King where Ely worked. Uh, he's currently in jail without bail, um, awaiting trial for that murder. And even though the police messed up, they made a mistake, did some things wrong in their investigation, it feels like justice was not served because a murderer went free and then murdered somebody else. Kind of on the other hand, in uh, even uh, in 2009, Lee Stinson was released after spending 23 years in prison for the 1985 first-degree murder of a 63-year-old woman. But after uh, new analysis with DNA and um, bite mark evidence revealed that none of the evidence that was used could actually tie Stinson to the crime that he was convicted of. So he spent years in prison and was innocent, theoretically, uh, was not guilty, um, Regardless of both of those stories, when you find out about those things happening, you, you have the feeling in both situations that justice was not served. It's a little bit aggravating, right, when things like that happen. One was innocent and was found guilty. One was guilty and found innocent or not, whatever. But it's disappointing when we see wrong like that done. In the passage we just read part of, a perfectly innocent man died for the crimes of others. And by the way, that's exactly what everyone in the story wanted. They didn't care about right and wrong. They didn't care about justice. They just wanted this man to die. In fact, they wanted him crucified. The evil men there wanted him dead, even though he was innocent. So what happens? We know, but look in verse 25. What happens when this innocent man, this, in fact, not just not guilty of the crimes but perfectly pure, sinless, spotless man, innocent man, not just man, but the God man, when they wanted him dead, verse 25, 
And it was the third hour, and they crucified him. He was innocent, and yet they killed him. That's injustice. Wrong was done. But God willingly allowed that. Jesus Christ willingly did that for us. Crucifixion is one of the the most agonizing method of death uh, throughout history. There's lots of ways, you know, today with the death penalty and things like that. uh, We try to be as, America tries to be as sanitary and gentle as possible, you know, um, but whatever. But back then, that wasn't the case. The ruling nation of the world, Rome, uh, would not use crucifixion for its own citizens because of how cruel and painful it was, but they would use it on other people, of other people and other people groups and other nations. And the Jews were perfectly acceptable with that. Uh, those being crucified would either, there's different ways it was done depending on how you read, um, but um, they would be laid on the wood cross and then lifted up on the vertical, on, on, they would be laid, nailed to the horizontal cross and then lifted on the vertical cross, or they'd be attached to it and then the whole thing dropped down into a hole. But regardless, no matter the method or the height possible, it was not a quick death. Um, Those crucified would sometimes live on the cross, from what I read, for up to nine days. Nine days of torment, of literal torture there, dying, um, but taking a long time to do that. We know Jesus did not live for nine days on the cross. He only lived for six hours on the cross, but six hours of terrible pain and torment, and not just the physical, but the spiritual upon him as well. But six hours is plenty long enough of a death. But after his cruel death, he willingly gave up the ghost, dying of his own volition. But why? Why did Jesus do that? Why did he endure that death? Why was he crucified? I want to give you three reasons this morning from the passage, and he's dealing with a different set of people, I guess we can call it that, say it that way, it's not perfect, but from those involved in the crucifixion, why was Jesus sent to the cross? Why was he crucified? Number one, I'll give you three points. Number one, because the people wanted Jesus to die. Why was Jesus crucified? Number one, because the people wanted Jesus to die. In verses 1 through 32, especially, we find the details leading up to the cross and then part of the crucifixion. But what's interesting is we read the Bible and in life as a Christian we see this, but God works, God's in general, God's work in this world is accomplished through people. God can work independently, but He often uses people uh, to see His will done. He sees that His work gets accomplished. And by the way, He does not force men or women to do wrong. By the way, neither does He force men or women to do right. God gives people a free will to choose, but He enables us to do His will. But He does not force His way through. Here in this story, this prophesied story, we see foreno- his, God's foreknowledge is seen and demonstrated in the story. His plan is unfolded. God is not the author of these men's sin, but He allowed it for a purpose. He knew how these people would respond to Jesus, and He allowed it. But in this passage is some of the most hateful behavior we can find from people. And let me give you several things under the people wanted Jesus to die. Number one, we see the accusation from these people. Verses 1 through 3, we'll go through the story, and then we'll make some application later. But in straight, Mark 15, 1, and straightway in the morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council and bound Jesus and carried him away and delivered him to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, Art thou the king of the Jews? And he answering said unto him, Thou sayest it. And the chief priest accused him of many things, but he answered nothing. The chief priests, uh, the religious leaders, they knew that Jesus had clearly declared himself to be Christ. Um, right across the, you know, you know, you have the two lines of script of text in your Bible more than likely. Right next to it says, "Art thou the King of the Jews?" is is in verse um, sixty one. The chief priest, the high priest, I'm sorry, asked, "Art thou the Christ?" So the priest said, "Art thou the Christ?" The Jews asked that. Pilate, the Roman leader, says, "Are you the King?" So, anyways, so the chief, the high priest, asked, "Art thou the Christ?" He says, "Yeah, I am. I am the Christ. I am." He's in fact, so he is the Messiah. He's the sent one. Um, He is the Savior, and they didn't like that, so they found more accusations against him. There's nothing wrong about him being the Christ, the Messiah, of course, but they started accusing him of blasphemy. They accused him of wanting to um, not just be the King of kings and Lord of lords, and one day the king that would take David's throne, which one day he will do, but the religious leaders accused Jesus of trying to steal the throne of Caesar at the time. That's not what Jesus was trying to do at all. But they accused him of doing that during that time to try to get him um, uh, to be found guilty of that. 
but they kept making up accusations against him. Verse 4 of Mark 15, And Pilate asked him again, saying, Answerest thou nothing? Behold, how many things they witness against thee. Jesus, they keep accusing you of these things. Aren't you going to defend yourself? No. He remained silent. So first there's accusation, and then we see there's corruption, which things overlap. Verse 6 says, Now at that feast he released unto them one prisoner, whomsoever they desired. So Jewish custom during the Passover feast, which the whole, by the way, when you read your Bible and it talks about how there was Passover, or it was uh, the Sabbath as well, that whole week is Passover, that whole week is, is uh, Sabbath, so Jesus didn't die on Friday. Someone asked us if, you know, if, we, if we celebrate Good Friday. No, we don't, because Jesus didn't die on Friday. <laughs> um, so if you do the math, he had to die on Wednesday. Some people say Thursday, but regardless, it definitely wasn't Friday. Anyways, that's another thing. So anyway, so Jesus, he, um, during the feast, they said, okay, somebody during Passover week can go, can go free. We'll pick one guilty person and will set them free. So that makes sense for it to be Jesus, because Jesus is actually innocent. But is that what happened? No, it's not. Verse 7, And there was one named Barabbas, which lay bound with them that had made insurrection with him, who had committed murder in the insurrection. And the multitude crying aloud began to desire him to do as he, would ever, as he had ever done unto them. But Pilate answered them, saying, Will ye that I release unto you the king of the Jews? For he knew that the chief priests had delivered him for envy. But the chief priests moved the people that he should rather release Barabbas. So this is another part of the corruption of the trial and of the whole, the whole thing. Jesus is innocent. They have the opportunity to set Jesus free, and they should have, but they didn't. They decided, no, no, we're not going to set the, set the Christ free. We're going to choose to set the murderer free. He was a murderer. He had committed insurrection, trying to overturn the city. He was actually guilty, by the way, of what they accused Jesus of doing on the legal side of it, um, trying to overturn the government. But they said, no, we'll set Barabbas free instead of, we'll set the murderer free instead of the Savior. In chapter 14, verse 64, it says this, Ye have heard the blasphemy, what think ye? And they all condemned him to be guilty of death. The whole thing was wrong. The next verse, and some men began to spit on him and to cover his face and to buffet him and to say unto him, prophesy, and the servants to strike him with the palms of their hands. Before he went to trial, they beat him and they spit on him. Before he was ever found guilty, they started mistreating him. They treated him like he was guilty before he was ever found guilty, falsely found guilty. So there's accusation, and then there's corruption, and then there's manipulation. In verse 11, we just read this, but the chief priest moved the people that he should rather release Barabbas unto them. And Pilate answered and said again unto them, What will ye then that I should do unto him whom ye call a king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him. So, someone made this point. Individuals are often smart, but people are dumb. <laughs> when people get into a crowd, they can be much more easily swayed. Chief priests, they moved the people. The people didn't find Jesus to be guilty, but the chief priests did, and they pushed them. They influenced the people, the crowds, so they would find him, so they would want him crucified. What will ye that I should do unto him whom ye call the king of the Jews? Crucify him. Why? What evil hath he done? The proper answer is he's guilty of this, he's guilty of this, but what do they say? Crucify him. We don't care what he's guilty of. We don't care what you think he's done. We just want him dead. That's what they did. Verse 15, And so Pilate, willing to content the people, he was swayed too. He knew that Jesus was innocent. But he chose the crowd over what was right. Willing to content the people, release Barabbas, Barabbas unto them, and deliver Jesus when he had scourged him to be crucified. The chief priests, then the people, then the judge. For no real reason they wanted Jesus dead. And the religious lost had so much hatred in them that their hatred became contagious and spread through the crowds. But then there's more. After the accusation, corruption, manipulation, then there's desecration. Verse 17. And they clothed him with purple and plaited a crown of thorns and put it about his head. 
and began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews. And they smote him on the head with a reed and did spit upon him, and bowing their knees, worshipped him. So they dressed him up. You say you're a king? Fine, we'll pretend you're a king. We'll put some, a purple robe, a royal color, a robe on you. We'll give you a crown, sure, but we're not going to give you a golden crown. We're going to give you a crown of thorns. They placed it into his brow, those long thorns into his, 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 his head and piercing and creating such pain and blood there. Okay, you're king of the Jews. We'll pretend you're king. Hail, right, king of the Jews. And it was so sad, verse 19, they bowed their knees and worshipped him. What a false, fake worship. They pretended to worship him. Again, the mockery, the hatred, the pain. And then the crucifixion. Verse 25, and it was the third hour, so 9 o'clock in the morning there, and they crucified him. They nailed him to the cross where he would hang and die. Why? Because these sinners hated Jesus so much. Some of them didn't understand why, but they chose to hate Jesus so much, even though he was sinless, and they were not. Let me show you a verse. Keep your finger here and mark. We'll come right back with John 7. John chapter number 7. Jesus speaking to his brothers, his you know, his siblings, Mary's other children. Um, and John 7, in verse 7. The reason why I say specifically who it was, Jesus is speaking to unsaved people. Verse 5, neither did his brethren believe in him. John 7, verse 6. Then Jesus said unto them, my time has not yet come, but your time is always ready. Now listen to this in verse 7. The world cannot hate you, but me it hateth. Why does the lost world hate Jesus? Because I testify of it, that the works thereof are evil. Want to know why people hate Jesus so much? Because He's light. Because people love darkness rather than light. When the Word of God is preached, when the Word of God is taught, when we are around godly people and things like that, we, the light of God is revealed in, on our life, and it shows the filth and the dirt and the grime. When Jesus is, is present, they see His righteousness, they see His purity, they see His character, they, see, they listen to every perfect word He says, and, and how everything they did, because He's the son, sinless Son of God, because He's God in the flesh, everything about Jesus is perfect and pure, and they're around Jesus and they hate it. They don't like being revealed, they don't like their, their sin being shown. People don't like their sin being revealed, and they hated Him for it. Because he did. The scribes and Pharisees, they often, every time seemed like Jesus would go against them and call them out on their sin and call them uh, whited sepulchers and vipers and things like that. When Jesus would call them for the, out for their sin, they hated it and they wanted them dead. Why did Jesus, why was Jesus crucified? Because the people hated him, because the people wanted Jesus to die. Number two, why did Jesus die? Why was Jesus crucified? Number two, because the Lord chose Jesus to die. Look at verse 33. Jesus is there on the cross. Verse 33. So three hours later, verse 33, then when, and when the sixth hour was come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. Mark 15, 34. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And some of them that stood by when they heard it be, said, Behold, he calleth Elias. And one ran and filled a sponge full of vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink, saying, Let alone let us see whether Elias will come to take him down. And Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. And the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. In the middle of a terrible story of the evil of people's hearts, we find God show up. Now, God is always present, even when He's not always visible. God is always present, even when He's not always visible. But in the middle of the crucifixion, three hours after it began, someone said that God turned the lights off in Jerusalem. <laughs> it went dark. I found this to be interesting in Fox, uh, not Fox's Book of Martyrs, but one of his other books, Acts and Monuments. He tells of uh, one Dr. Hunter, a martyr um, in Queen Mary's time there in England, who fastened him to a stake to be burnt. And while Hunter was, on, on, uh, was nailed to be burnt, he prayed this short prayer, Son of God, shine upon me. And immediately the sun and the firmament shone out of the dark cloud, so full in his face that he was forced to look another way. 
which was very comfortable to him. So that martyr had the sun shining on his face, but Jesus had the lights turn off. It went dark for him. People often said that's when God had to turn his back on his son who took our sin for us. But there's darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. So for three hours there, in the middle of the day, it was dark. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why did God do that? Because the Lord chose for Jesus to die. Revelation 13, 8, speaking of Jesus, calls him the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Since earth was created, God had a plan. By the way, the world was created. We can just do the simple math, being literal about it. Jesus, from the foundation of the world, that was before Adam and Eve sinned. When Adam and Eve sinned there in the garden, God wasn't surprised. God knew. So God always had a plan for when man sins, he will have a Savior. That was mentioned in Genesis 3.15 about how he would send the seed of the woman to defeat Satan, right? So God always had a plan for Jesus Christ, the Son of God, to be born of a virgin, to come and to live and to live a sinless life and to bleed and die for the sins of mankind. Why did Jesus die? Why did Jesus endure such contradiction of sinners? Why did Jesus endure the pain and the punishment and the betrayal and all the terrible things? Because God had a plan for our sins to be paid for. In Isaiah 53, in verse number 10, it just says this, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. That's a tough verse. Why in the world would it please the Lord to bruise Jesus? Why did Jesus die? It was for us. Let's go to 1 Peter 1. So go to the back of your Bible, 1 Peter 1. In verse 18, let me give you, show you a couple of verses there. In 1 Peter 1, verse 18 through 21. First Peter 1.18 says, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation, received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God, they raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. This little passage tells us why, several reasons why Jesus was to be crucified. In verse 18, it says that we can be redeemed. You know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things. Your money, your good works, nothing you can do, nothing you can physically give to God would do anything to remove your sins. Nothing, nothing at all. In fact, if you try to, if you're, if you're dependent on anything you do, any, deci- any, any, any spiritual works or feelings or anything you try to do religiously or just being a good moral person, anything you try to do, anything you're dependent upon to get yourself to heaven won't do you any good. In fact, it hurts you. The only way you can be saved is by the precious blood of Christ. You can only be saved through what Jesus Christ has done. But how, why did Jesus die so He can shed His blood so that salvation would be possible for us to go to heaven? And then verse 21, it says, Who by Him do believe in God that raised Him from the dead? Why did Jesus die? So He can be raised from the dead to prove the glory and power of God. Verse 21, it's the next phrase, And He raised Him from the dead and gave Him glory so that Jesus Christ Himself would be glorified for His death but also for His resurrection so that God the Father would be glorified by sending His Son so that we can be saved. And then verse 21, why did Jesus die? Why was He crucified? Who by Him do believe in God that raised Him up from the dead and gave Him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. The reason why Jesus did all that was to glorify God, to be resurrected, to purchase salvation so that you and I, so that our faith and our dependency, our hope would be in God. That's why the Lord was pleased to bruise Him. That's why God allowed Jesus to go. God is not some vindictive, overly angry, harsh God. He is pleased that His Son would die for us. Why was Jesus crucified? Because the people wanted Jesus to die. Why was Jesus crucified? Because the Lord chose Jesus to die. Why was Jesus crucified? Number three, because the sinner needed Jesus to die. At the end of our story in Mark 15, 
And Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. And the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to the bottom. By the way, they're in the same area. The crucifixion there on Calvary on Golgotha's hill was not right in the middle of Jerusalem. It was outside the city. They weren't there like, okay, Jesus is dead, and they ripped it. God did that. God ripped the dividing line between man and God so that any man can approach God through the blood of Christ. Let's go to a, a slightly familiar passage, and we'll, well, I'll quote a few more verses. John 3, verse 16. We're nearly done. John 3, verse 16. Jesus was crucified, humanly speaking, because people hated Him and wanted Him dead. Jesus was crucified, theologically speaking, because Jesus was the only hope for mankind and God sent Him in His divine plan. But set aside the humanly speaking, there was God. Setting aside the theologically speaking side, there was people. There's a simple reason we simply needed Jesus to die. With the crucifixion, the details of the story we just read, the account we just read, for God so loved the world, that's the reason why. The reason why He did what? That He gave His only begotten Son. I think so often we think of for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. We go straight to Bethlehem, although that's true. But God didn't just give His Son to be born. God gave His Son to die. The gift was for His death. God loves you and I so much that He gave His only begotten Son to die, to suffer that agonizing death on the cross. For what purpose? That whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life? The sinner needs Jesus to die. The Bible is abundantly clear that all men are sinners. We need a Savior. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Galatians 3.22 says it this way, But the Scripture hath concluded... It goes a little bit deeper, a little bit more long-sounding. But the Scripture hath concluded all under sin. In other words, when we read the law, when we, when we see the high standard of God, it shows us we sin. When the Bible, God says, Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, and we lie. We may not like to admit it, but we're liars. We have lied in our life at some point. Sometimes it's just easier to get by with the lie. God says, Thou shalt not bear false witness, and yet we lie. We're guilty. The Scripture hath concluded that the carry is under sin. The Bible says don't steal. Sometimes we take things that don't belong to us, um, especially as children and things like that maybe. Um, but we take what's not ours. The Scripture hath concluded that carries carry is under sin. The Bible says thou shalt not covet. Don't desire things that God's not given you. Don't desire things that, that aren't yours, and yet we crave a new car, a bigger house, a nicer property, uh, more a nicer house and kitchen decor, and all these things that we like, a new phone, whatever comes out next. And the Bible hath concluded that carry is under sin. For the Scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. We're all sinners, but all unsaved sinners are perishing. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believed in Him should not perish. Perish means to be destroyed, to waste away, but there's a location of the perishing. It's in hell. In hell forever. The wages of sin is death. It's separation from God. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. All mankind are sinners. All unsaved sinners are perishing, but there's good news. All perishing sinners can be saved. But God commendeth His love. He proves His love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. With the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the Scripture saith, Whosoever believeth in him, on him should not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. When Jesus was crucified, shedding his blood and dying, the veil, the separator between God and men for worship and sacrifice was opened so that all men can freely access God if they will believe. Why was Jesus crucified? Because we needed Him to. And 1 Peter 3.18 says, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that He might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. It's a, it's a long conversation, a deep thing to think about, but Jesus' death was completely unjust. And yet, 
Jesus, the sinless, spotless Son of God, dying in my place and in yours, satisfy the justice of God. God needed bloodshed by a perfect sacrifice. God says the wages of sin is death. Somebody must die for your sins, and it can't be you because you're a sinner. Jesus had to die. Why did Jesus die? (laughs) Because the people hated Him, because the Lord chose Him to die, because the Lord loved us so much that the sinner needed Jesus to die. Let me ask you a simple question. Are you saved? You know, Sometimes people come and you wonder about folks when they're visitors and you think, okay, they don't look like a Christian. We get, become judgmental. We think maybe that we just assume, you know, I assume when people come and if they're not normally in church, I tend to assume that people are lost because most, not because they look a certain way, because most people are lost. Statistically speaking, most people in this world, if they died today, they'd go to hell. But people sit in churches and people are members of churches all over our country, all over this world, and if they died, they'd go to hell because they they may be religious, they may be sincere, they may be faithful, they may give, they may have been baptized, but if they've never trusted Jesus to be their Savior, and they die that way, they'll die and go to hell. Have you ever been saved? Has there been a specific moment in your life where you trusted Jesus to be your Savior? When did you believe on Christ to be your Savior? Well, I've always been a Christian. Then you've never been a Christian. Have you ever trusted Jesus to be your Savior? trusting His death for you, His resurrection. Lord, I know I'm a sinner. Would you please forgive me my sins and be my Savior? If you've trusted Jesus to be your Savior, you're saved forever. But if you've never trusted Christ, you're condemned already. Have you believed on Christ? The tragic story that we read is a story of victory because it means heaven. It means salvation. It means relationship with God. It means being made right with God. It also means, that we'll talk about next week, it means Jesus rose again offers life to everyone. Have you been saved? If you've not, won't you trust Christ today? In just a minute, we're going to pray, and I'm not going to pressure anybody, but if you've never trusted Jesus to be your Savior, I'd love to take a Bible or one of our workers to take a Bible and just explain from the Scriptures clearly and as simply as possible how you can know for certain if you died today, tomorrow, or know for certain 30 years from now if you died, you'd go to heaven. If you've never been saved, I'd love to help you trust Christ today. If you are saved, we owe a serious debt to live our life for the Lord. If you've been saved, you can't make yourself more saved. You've got to live your life dedicated to our wonderful Savior for all He's done for us.